As we begin our worship, please stand. And again, we'll be using service setting three as we find it on page 188 of your hymnals, if you prefer to follow along that way. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done. And we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, ask for giving you all your sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross, and he freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. Thank you. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, you form the minds of your faithful people into a single will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise. But among the many changes of this world, our hearts may ever yearn for the lasting joys of heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. And the peace of God's forgiveness and grace that he again pours out to us this morning, through his promises and through his word, we have the joy of coming to God's word this morning. Our first reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2. It continues our set of readings from Peter's first epistle that we've been following during this Easter season. And that makes sense on the number of levels to focus on Peter's epistle during Easter. Peter actually witnessed the resurrection for starters. He can speak to it. And then also, Peter was one of the first great evangelists for the gospel, as we'll hear again in today's sermon. But more than the messenger, even, is the message that Peter shares here. Christ is the stone upon which God built something so much larger. Finally, Christ is the only way to heaven, as we'll hear more today in the remainder of our readings and in our sermon. We listen as God shares that with us here. For the apostles. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey this message, which is also what they were destined for, as anybody would be who disobeys the message. But you, my readers, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with today's psalm, Psalm 118. It's the great Easter psalm that the Apostle Paul just echoed in our first reading, and we'll also hear it echoed in today's sermon. It reinforces today's theme, that people are either built upon the rock of Christ or they stumble over it. He is the only way. The Bible teaches there is no in-between, and that's okay when, like Peter's first audience, we've gotten into by faith. Uh, this morning we'll sing this psalm from the beginning of our hymnal. Again, that's Psalm 118, which we'll sing from the beginning of our journey.
God excluding people from paradise. This is the way that God would include more people into his heavenly worlds. We'll talk about that more in today's sermon. For now, out of love and respect for these words and works of Jesus, please stand for the reading of today's gospel. We read, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus said, You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I can go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Know the place to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, the Lord, show us the Father, then that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show me the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, rather it is the Father living in me, who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. As we prepare to focus on God's word further in our sermon today, we we'll prepare our hearts for that with our hymn of the day, Christ be the way in whom we walk. If you'd like to follow along with the music in your hymnal, it's hymn 516, and we'll sing all three stanzas. Amen. Dear 
friends in Christ Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. Of course, those are the words we heard just a few minutes ago in our gospel reading, also echoed beautifully so in our hymn. And unless you twist those words to mean, some, to mean something other than what they plainly mean, there is just no getting around it. That is Jesus claiming to be the only way to heaven. In other words, without faith in him, he's saying you're just not going to get there. And people struggle with that in our world. For that matter, we do too. Because we live in a world that hates exclusion and exclusivity. But the fact of the matter is, it actually has to be this way. And it's far more inclusive than you may think. That's what God shares with us today in his word, and especially in our sermon. In Acts chapter 4, beginning with verse 8, we listen as God shares this with us here. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, and we are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man now stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Here in these words, Peter is addressing the Sanhedrin. Now that was the Jewish high court back in those days, which consisted primarily of a political party we call the Sadducees. Now, we don't know as much about the Sadducees, or at least say we don't think about them as much as we do the Pharisees that existed in Bible times, because the Pharisees were the ones who were more influential among the common people, and that's where Jesus spent most of his time. But these Sadducees are important, too, because they were the so-called movers and shakers in government, and that's exactly why Peter finds himself before them here. Uh, he has been arrested for, well, healing a man miraculously, and like the same group did with Jesus, the charges are trumped up. And in verse 9, it's evident that their charges revolve around how Peter had healed this man. And the fact that Peter is arrested already suggests that they thought it must be through some kind of illicit or demonic activity, much like they once accused Jesus of, if we go back to the Gospels. But Peter doesn't bite, he doesn't hold back any punches for that matter. In verse 10, he makes it clear that he did this miracle by the name and power of Jesus. Which should be impossible because the same group had already killed Jesus after all. And Peter doesn't fail to mention that here either. But he goes on to testify about how that was at the end that God raised Jesus from the dead. Shows us that Jesus really was God's promised Messiah. And finally, if the disciples were healing others in Jesus' name, that means they really must come from God. And there was nothing wrong with what they were doing. And so in saying this, Peter, he defends himself. And not only does he defend himself, he, he not so subtly condemns these Sadducees for their actions. Now, the question may be, why did the Pharisees or the, the Sadducees, like I said, we always think of the Pharisees, but today we're talking about Sadducees. Why did the Sadducees do all of this? And it's fairly obvious once you, you stop and think about it. Just like they had seen Jesus as the threat to themselves, and so the same body that Jesus executed, so also they saw the disciples as the threat to them. 
and finally put it in the terms we are talking about today, these Sadducees, they, they simply hated the exclusivity of Jesus Christ because in this case, it threatened their power and their authority and their influence among the people. And things have changed in the last 2,000 years. But whatever may be the case today, it's true that people continue to hate the so-called exclusivity of Christ. I mean, it's true, isn't it? People in our world can't stand this idea that anybody without Jesus would go to hell. And as I mentioned earlier, for that matter, we can't either. We struggle with this too. For example, it's why we might try to make an exception if somebody we love dies with what seems to be no faith. Now, don't misunderstand me. God can do amazing things with the littlest things possible. And all it would take is just a kernel of faith in that person's heart to save them. That is true. But at the same time, God doesn't tell us to look at the heart. He tells us to look at the outward appearance. He tells us to look at a person's fruits of faith. And, and so, what happens if we look at a person's fruits and we don't see any faith? Yeah, maybe they grew up in the church. Maybe they were baptized at one time, but that was decades ago. What if we don't see anything? Do we really pin all of our hopes on some sort of exception in their hearts? Or do we accept what is likely the exclusivity of Jesus Christ? And we struggle with that everywhere, not just there, but in every aspect of our lives. For example, it's why we try to get around certain sins that we commit. For example, it's really easy to point the finger and say, oh, homosexuality, transsexualism, whatever it may be, that is a sin. And to be fair, it is a sin. It is wrong. But how often do you and I just ignore our own blatant heterosexual sin? Or how often do we lament the terrible things we might see in the news or on our Facebook feed? Just horrible acts of violence, theft, people being horrible to other people, things like that. And again, those things, they are clearly wrong. And yet, how often have we hurt others just as much? We have cheated them out of things in a way that is just as sinister, if only more clandestine. Oh, sure, maybe they don't know about it. Maybe it's not up there on Facebook for the world to see, but are we any better? No, not at all. Again, we see this everywhere in our lives. Finally, we see it in the way that we try to get around certain Bible teachings. Just to take one, how about the, the Bible's teaching of church fellowship? As a congregation, we, we follow that teaching, but isn't it true that as individuals we, we struggle with that so much? We think about how to practice our faith with others and where we can bend the rules. We, we don't like to think that the differences between Christian churches is so serious, and we don't like to imagine that sin can divide us so much in this world. And, and so instead of starting with unity based on God's word that may exclude some people, we prefer to start with the exceptions to include more people, even if it means ignoring some things that Jesus says elsewhere in his word. It's not just the Sadducees, it's not just the world around us, it's you, it's, it's me, it's in our hearts too. We struggle with this. And in rebelling against the exclusivity of Christ. We are rejecting our God. In doing so, we, we revel in sin. And that just as much should earn us hell. As harsh as that sounds, it also has to be that way. Think about it. That Jesus is carefully preparing a spot in heaven for us. And we know he is, right? He said he is in our gospel reading. If that's what Jesus is doing then how can he just invite us into heavenly dwellings if we insist that he include not just us, but all of this baggage, all of this sin with us? Far from it being a cruel act of exclusion for Jesus to bar us from heaven, it's actually an act of love. It's Jesus saying, I don't want heaven ruined by this same sin. I don't want it to just become a second fall on earth. And finally, that's just the start of things. Because God doesn't just stop with that. He doesn't just end his love with offering us from heaven. No, what did Jesus do? He took it a step further. Namely, if we were going to be barred from heaven, Jesus said, okay, I'm going to be barred from heaven too. And that is exactly what Jesus did when he suffered and died on the cross. 
cross. Now maybe that's hard for us to think about because we just see Jesus hanging there on the cross for a few hours and we think, well, he's going to spend the rest of eternity now with us in heaven. But make no mistake, in those few hours on the cross, eternity passed. Each and every one of your sins and mine, which warranted eternal separation from God, was burned off of the living flesh of Jesus Christ until none of it was left. Save for the relief of death. Until in the end, not even death was left. It's that wonderful Easter truth, right? We heard it again today. As we go back to our text, what did Peter tell the Sadducees? God raised Jesus from the dead. God raised Jesus from the dead. He lives. And if that's true, what power did the Sadducees have in comparison to that? For that matter, what can anything else in this world offer compared to what God offers to us in his risen son, victorious over death itself? And that explains what we hear as we read on. Not only did Jesus have all of God's power in this way, but he also had the power to take the evil thing the Sadducees had done and also the evil thing we did our sins with Jesus on the cross too. He had the power to take that evil thing and turn it into salvation. As we're told, the stone you builders, you Sadducees, you members of Grace Lutheran Church have rejected. It has become the cornerstone. God took the stone that we would cast away in Jesus and he turned it into the start of a building for heavenly dwelling. And not just for some select group, but, as we see at the end, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given to mankind by which we must be saved. And finally, you think about those words. Is it exclusive? Yeah. It's how people must be saved after all, so without it, it's going to exclude you. But at the same time, is it also inclusive? Yes, this is the one thing that can work for all mankind. Even these Sadducees, they could have been saved too if they repented of sin and believed in Jesus as their Savior. You see, Jesus really is the only way to heaven. While all people were previously excluded from a perfect God's heaven in sin, all all are now included, so long as it is through faith in Jesus as their Savior from sin. The benefits of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are there for every man, woman, and child who has ever lived. You think about it then, apart from that being excluding, exclusive, it's really the most inclusive teaching there is in the whole world. Because no matter who you are, no matter what you've done wrong, no matter what guilt you live with, no matter how you turn others, if you repent of your sin and turn in faith to Jesus as your Savior, then none of that matters. It doesn't matter how much that weighs you down. It doesn't matter how other people look at you. None of that. If you repent and you turn to Jesus, God says, you will live someday and you will rise to eternal promise. That's what Jesus did. Nothing else in the world, no other teaching is going to offer you that. Anywhere else, you're left wondering if you've done enough to earn it, if you've been good enough. Are you good enough? Or you're trying to follow the right moral code to get in. But which one? That varies from one religion to the next. In some way, somebody will always be excluded. And to be frank, most people are going to be left in doubt as they, they look at that standard, that high bar that is set and wonder, am I really good enough? They look at our hearts as they see the things they've done wrong. And let's be clear, we would be no different. We are no better. But that is not what we see. It's not true for us, not with Jesus. Because we know Jesus wants all people to be saved. And unlike any other path out there, Jesus actually did something to offer salvation to all. 
dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Think about that, and then seriously embrace the exclusivity of Jesus. Love it. Be comforted by it. For the fact that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, the only way to heaven. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. It's a good thing for you. And it's a good thing for everyone you love, everyone in your life. Because only with this can we now offer to others a living faith, rather than a dead religion that doesn't fix their problems, nor ours. Only with this can we offer to other people a living Savior, rather than a dead faith, a dead hope that doesn't fix their guilty consciences, nor ours. Only with this can we offer to people life itself rather than death when they are looking into a grave. Just like we find when we look at our own graves. And when other people look at all of this and they respond, I just can't believe that Christianity is too negative, it's too intolerant, it's too exclusive and, and excluding. Don't give in. Don't, don't accept that premise. Instead, in love, reach out to them still and show them a different picture. Show them what God has graciously shown you, and it's not that picture. Show them that, no, 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 you don't understand, this is a good thing. Why would I complain about this being the only way when it's the only way that gives me what I need? There isn't another way. This is what you're looking forward to. You're not going to find it anywhere else. This is a good thing, and Jesus is there for you, too. You know, it's interesting that in a world that hates exclusion, and we do, too, yet the more you try to include other people, the more you will deter and exclude some people they, they don't share in that viewpoint. You saw that with the ugly politics back in Jesus' day with the Sadducees excluding him, his disciples, anyone who threatened their authority, and we see that in our politics today, all over the place. And finally, why is that? It's because, in its most basic form, that sin. It's this reality that there is always something that's going to fight to separate us from other people. And that is why only Jesus will do it. He is the way through this mess where nothing else is. He is the truth that gives answers that nothing else does. He is the light that rose in victory over sin and left it dead in the ground. Nothing else gives you that. Jesus really is the only way to heaven. And finally, if we live in a world that is always going to exclude some people because of sin, what else would we want to be the only way to heaven other than this? The way that can also include every last man, woman, and child who knows Jesus, no matter who they are. Show people that picture of Jesus. Make sure that's the Jesus they're seeing, because it's the Jesus that too few people in this world are seeing. Show people your Savior, and before you show it to them, make sure you're seeing him for yourself, too. Amen. Please stand. And now may the grace of God passes all our human understanding Guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus to life which is everlasting. Amen. We'll continue now with our confession of faith. Before we return back to our hymnal, we'll use a confession of faith that you can find written in your bulletin or on the screens, uh, as is our custom here at Grace during the Easter season. The confession of faith that we find in Scripture itself in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We confess together. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, what is this good news that saves us? We confess together with Paul. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, 
that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Uh, after that, he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. The witnesses testified, so there would be no doubt. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, and we will too. This is most certainly true. Please be seated. At this time, we'll continue with our offering and also with the children's sermon, so I invite the kids of the congregation to come up. Where can we go? Well, we're going to go to heaven, but where can we go to show us the way to heaven? The Bible. 
the Bible, right? We, we listen to God's word like we do in church, like we do in Sunday school. Maybe your parents read Bible stories at home. And that always reminds us how to get to heaven, and especially how Jesus did all the work. What, what did Jesus do? You guys know it. Yeah, and that's always so important because when we have difficulties, why do bad things happen? What causes them? Sin. Sin. Jesus took those sins away. And to get to heaven, well, what, what couldn't we take to heaven with us? What could we not take to heaven with us? That would ruin it. Our sin, right? Yeah, because then there would be sin in heaven. That would be good. So Jesus took it away, right? We can always follow Jesus. And that's why I will always love having you in church because this is where Jesus guides us and he shows us the way. Just like your parents... Just like they can drive in the vehicle and take you home or to your grandparents or wherever you need to go. Jesus, he can do that for heaven. As long as we have him, we don't need to worry. Let's pray about that, all right? We, we fold our hands and we bow our heads and we pray. Dear Jesus, when we worry about how we will get to heaven and how we will deal with other difficult things in our lives, keep reminding us you are the way. Thank you for preparing a place for us in heaven and for taking us to be with you someday. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Let's say it together. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll see you guys later. Thanks for coming up. Whether we pray together or alone, you have promised to hear us and answer us. Give us patience to accept your blessings in whatever way you send them. In your love and wisdom, prepare us for the day when you will take us to be with you forever. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. And we will continue with the final set of prayers. Do note that we'll return back to page 
171 of the hymnal as we do so. We pray. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We also pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, dear brothers and sisters in the faith, proceed with the leading hearts, the benediction of our Lord. Again, this morning we'll use the Easter benediction that we find in Hebrews 13. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that good shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And we'll close our service with our final hymn, a hymn that echoes more of Jesus' words from our gospel reading. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Uh, it's in 809, we'll sing all the stanzas. Beautiful hymn, a little bit newer in our circles. So if you're not familiar with it, you'd like to just sit out at the beginning, uh, join in later, you're welcome to do that. A nice time to join in might be after verse 1 as we get into the refrain, since we'll start with the refrain. So you'll hear that first, then we'll do verse 1. And somewhere in there, uh, if you'd like to wait to join in there, you're welcome to, or join in at the beginning. We join our hearts together in song.
from them. And other than that, those are the announcements I have. Anybody else have any announcements to share with the congregation? Seeing none. Great the worship that you had today. God bless you this week, and we'll see you on the way out.